Hey, welcome to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We want to talk about finding out, figuring out your actual personality type. We get people taking the test at Personality Hacker, our personality test, and we get a lot of questions on the website, on Facebook, on the community about, okay, I've taken your test, guys. I've taken other tests on different websites. I get maybe different results from your test, other tests. You know, are these tests accurate? How can I actually know my real personality type? Like maybe my results didn't resonate with me or I'm just, I wanna just make sure. And obviously that's our goal for you as well. We want you to know your personality type as as closely as possible to its actual type. So today we wanna talk about the confusion around type and, and if you're having some confusion on knowing for sure your type, how to really get down to the nitty gritty and understand what your actual personality type is. Yeah, especially when you type out as maybe two or three different types consistently. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm an INFP on this test. I'm an INFJ on this test. I also typed that as an ENFP. Like, which one am I? Am I an ENFP, an INFP, or an INFJ? And when you're just getting started, it doesn't feel like an ENFP and an INFJ would have anything in common. So that feels like a huge spread. But there are certain types that have a lot of resemblance to each other in, in, in interesting ways, in interesting, unexpected ways, so that when you answer the questions in a certain way, because most of the types, you know, most of these personality tests are what are called forced choice question tests, meaning the question will give you an A or B, right? And you have to choose one or the other. And so you're forced into an answer. And... Sometimes you just don't know what to put, right? Like it's like, well, it's A and B or it's neither A nor B. So then you go with the thing that you think is closest to you, but neither really felt satisfying or satisfactory. And then you end up because because that might change based on mood, right? Like one day you might choose A and another day you might choose B when neither of them feels very good to you. So then you end up with inconsistent results. You end up as different personality types, personality types that are very similar to each other, resemble each other in behavior, but have radically different ways of thinking. And so it can get frustrating. It can get really frustrating to go, well, on this test, I tested as this. And on this one, I tested as this. And which one am I? Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things we want to do on this podcast is really give some frameworks for how to go about really understand your type. So obviously, you know, here at Personality Hacker and there's other people that do this as well, we have a type verification process. So if you you went through, you took your test, you even got your premium results and you you just wanted to verify. We've had people that will hire us to get on the phone or get on Skype, get on the internet with them and have a quick chat to verify their type. So that's there's one route to do that is to hire a professional that really understands profiling to sit down with you and go through your personality type to verify that. So yeah. that's that's an obvious like low-hanging fruit answer. That takes some time and money investment, but that's a that is a solution, obviously. Yeah. Well, but not to cut a pitch off at the knees. <laughs> well, I'm not pitching that necessarily. No, I mean, I, that's an offer, but you know. Yeah, but I mean, like, I, I yes, yes, I do that. We do that. We'll do profile verification calls, and I think we're really good. I think we're some of the best. Obviously, I think we're some of the best. That said, I know of people who have done that with you know other companies and. They got the, like, literally the exact opposite type. Like, like they are an ENTP, and they hired somebody to do profile verification, and they ended up as an ISFJ. I actually know somebody who did this. Yeah. And so that isn't always... <laughs> it's not 100% either. 100% either, right? Like, you, you can hire a professional, and they can see something in you that is their blind spot and they'll type you as a totally opposite type. Now, there's a couple different guidelines. Now, the reason why I say I don't want to cut a pitch off at its knees is I don't want to indicate that if you contact us and you get a profile verification that that's going to happen. I actually think we're really good. One of the things that I think actually makes us very good at that is that if I can't tell, I'll tell you and I'll give you your money back. (laughs) I have actually like had some really tough nuts to crack it's taken an hour at the end of the hour i'm like i am not sure if you're an intp or an intj right i'll just say i'm not sure it will it'll take more information and there are some people who you know they're they're basically on the ends of the bell curve the vast majority of people is not difficult to tell their type right but there's you've got people who are on one side incredibly underdeveloped those people or have a personality disorder or have some 
something in the system, some node in the system that is basically coloring everything else. And on the other side of the bell curve, you've got people who are extremely developed, right? Like you've got people who've been working on themselves for a long time. They're very developed. And it's hard to tell because they're so balanced in so many different ways. And so anytime you're on the edges of the bell curve, you're going to be tough to, to, to profile. Most people in the, you know, in the middle though are relatively easy and the type descriptions found in most places are going to resonate if it's the right type. So we're going to, we're going to address the people in the middle of the bell curve, not the people on the edges, because those are usually the people who uh, it's very, it's not that difficult to figure out what their type is. It's just a matter of some initial confusion. So there's a couple different principles to remember, and these may or may not be helpful to you, right? Because I know that this is a very confusing world that you enter. But there's a couple different principles that I think are very important to establish early on in the self-typing process. Now, the first thing is to remember that everybody is unique. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody's different. Let's pretend, let's pretend Myers-Briggs is empirically true. Let's pretend it's not just a map that we use to navigate the world, right? Let's pretend that is empirical truth that you are one of 16 types. There are 7 billion people on the planet. There's going to be some variation, yeah. <laughs> right? Like there's going to be a little bit of difference between all of these different people of the same type. So when you're looking for information on each of these types and you're trying to identify yourself as one of them, you can't just look at somebody's I'm an INTP and this is how I am, mm -hmm. right? If you if you suspect you might be an INTP, you're going to need to look at a lot of those, right? Because you're going to resonate with some and not with others because there's more factors in personality than just your Myers-Briggs personality type. So that's one really important thing to remember at the beginning. The second thing is that when you're first entering the world of personality typology, and in particular the Myers-Briggs, because we're talking about primarily the Myers-Briggs or the genius style assessment, people enter it it, it always it always just really surprises me in like a good way it delights me actually where people enter this world very confused by their type they read a description of an ENFP and they just read a description of an ENTP and both of them really resonate mm -hmm. and yet they're not satisfied like they don't look at it and go oh this is just you know bs this is just cold reading you know this is ridiculous there's something about it that's really striking a chord. And they can tell that there's gold here to be mined. They just need to figure out their vein of gold. Sure. That really delights me because it says that this is powerful information even in the midst of confusion. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. That said, as you're going down the road or you're entering this world, this space that you can intuitively tell can have some really powerful information here if you can just figure out what your type is. It's really important to remember that you are at the very tippy, 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 tippy top of the iceberg, okay? Most of the the real value of this system is not where it can be seen, but it's under, you know, it's submerged underwater like an iceberg is. Yeah. <laughs> the vast majority of it is is content and information that goes way down a rabbit hole. And oftentimes, if you're having a lot of trouble figuring out your type, the, it's not just a matter of like reading the right type description. It's a matter of investing some time and effort into getting to the lower parts of that iceberg. It's in understanding some of the more complex concepts and realizing how it really works. It's not just a matter of going, you know, I'm an, I, I'm an ENFJ. And all ENFJs are ENFJs are ENFJs. That's not how it works. ENFJs share certain attributes. They share certain qualifications or qualities. And that's the part that you're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of, I mean, otherwise it would be like, which Disney princess are you? <laughs> yeah. It's like Facebook, which Disney princess are you? Oh, I'm Cinderella. Okay, done, right? It's, there's so much more here. There's so much more meat here. That's not just a matter of finding your one of your 16 types qualification or classification. It's actually understanding what that means. And sometimes you have to get to the deeper principles before you can figure out what, you know, what your quote unquote type is. Yeah. So let me, I want to say three things really quick, just before we keep going here. So the first thing that you mentioned is finding out what your type is. so You can go into the deep stuff. I think one of the things, how I look at personality type now versus how I used to look at it is, once you know your personality type, that's the starting point. That's not the answer. That's the starting point 
to get more answers about who you are as a person. In other words, once you know, for example, in the Myers-Briggs, let's say you're, I'm an ENFP. Once I know I'm an ENFP, that is a code to tell me how my mind is actually working. So it's a code that lets me know how my mind learns information and how my mind makes decisions. Which leads me to my second thing that I want to say is this isn't so much about behavior. Behavior obviously emerges from our personality. But, you know, you're, you're looking at the behavior of an ENFP and say, well, I behave that way, so I must also be an ENFP. That's a bad way to look at it because it's not about the behavior. Certain behaviors will manifest themselves over time and, and patterns will emerge. But it's, again, it's more about how your mind is working, what's going on behind the scenes, inside the mind, how it's making decisions, how it's learning information. Behavior emerges from that. So you could have totally two different types that behave very similar. It doesn't mean they're the same personality type. It means that their mind is just emerging the same behavior from how their minds work. So that's something else to keep in mind. And the other thing that, that you really hit on as well is looking at others and saying, well, I'm like, you know, I'm like this TV character, so that must be my personality type because that's their personality type. Or I'm like this person in my life. You know, my mom's an ISFJ. I'm very similar to my mom in this way, so I must also be an ISFJ or whatever. Uh, that's also, I think, a road that can lead us down mistyping. So just keeping those things into mind. You're not necessarily looking at behavior. You're not looking at other people to compare and contrast. These are things that can help you, but these aren't the things you're actually looking at. And understanding your, your code, your four-letter code in the Myers-Briggs system, for example, is just the starting point. And it can be reverse engineered. If you know how your mind, if you can get to the point of how your mind learns or makes decisions, you can reverse engineer your type. And often this is what we're doing in live profiling sessions, is we're going into your mind by asking certain questions and, and having discussion with you to determine how you're making decisions about the thing we're talking about or how you're learning information. So a lot of things are coming to the factor, how you're answering questions, the confusion you have, the way your voice is, all these things matter because we're learning how your mind is working which then gives us your type. So you can go either direction, reverse engineering. You go under the the iceberg and then get the tip or start at the tip and go down under and, and realize the personality can come from either direction. I'm so glad you mentioned the reverse engineering because that's, when I say go deeper, that's effectively what I'm talking about or essentially what I'm talking about. Understanding that underneath the hood of the car, right, all of those, like you said, it's not just manifest behaviors. Behaviors will oftentimes... Like you mentioned, there'll be a pattern of behaviors that all, say, ENTPs will have a tendency toward. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean all ENTPs are going to behave the same way. And so it's really about understanding what are technically called the cognitive functions or the mental processes for an ENTP to really determine whether or not you're an ENTP. Are you using, for so for the Myers-Briggs geeks out there, ENTPs, two primary mental processes or cognitive functions are technically called extroverted intuition and introverted thinking. We call them exploration and accuracy. The one thing that all ENTPs have in common is that. That is the one thing that every ENTP on the planet has in common. They're leading with a mental process called exploration, and they're you know supplementing that with a mental process that we call accuracy. That's what makes them an ENTP, That's that very what, thing. Right. It's not that ENTPs have a tendency to be quick-witted, or it's not that ENTPs have a tendency to really like, you know, like... Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> but I found that a lot of ENTPs do like chocolate. Except for your son who likes vanilla. <laughs> That's true, he does. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not just that they, you know, they have a tendency to, you know, love getting into verbal spats or they like, the yeah, they like systems, right? Like yeah. there's certain behaviors that come from these mental processes, but they're just the behaviors. They're just manifestations. And if an ENTP is not particularly quick-witted, that doesn't mean they're not an ENTP, right? So... Being able to understand the cognitive functions or the mental processes, which is really the four-letter code, like you mentioned, keep calling it a four-letter code. That's because we call it we call it a decoder ring to try to figure out what those mental processes are. So if you want to just get to the you know to the to the meat of it, so to speak, go straight to the cognitive functions and understand those. And then when you figure out which cognitive functions are resonating with you the strongest, which one's your flow state? Right, there are eight. Read a description of all eight. Figure out your flow state. Right, which one is your flow? Mm -hmm. If you can figure that out, you already have three letters of <laughs> of the uh, of your Myers Briggs type already. If you can figure out what your auxiliary supplemental or what we call copilot process is, mm -hmm. then you can figure out your full four letter code. So, don't be afraid to get under the hood. Don't be afraid to do, as you mentioned, a bit of reverse engineering. 
And this really brings us to a broader issue, which is that if you are looking for, you know, experts, quote unquote, or lab coat mentality people that have all the answers for you, they're going to hand this to you. That's really not reality in your world. I mean, this might be earth shattering to you. You might have already known this. I don't know. But if you're listening, think of people like us here at Personality Hacker around personality psychology. Think of us more as guides or coaches than experts who have the answer. I think we're, we have a lot of expertise. I would consider us experts. But this really is you that makes the determination about your type. You're the one that's going to look at a bunch of information. You're going to look at all your different test results. You're going to listen to our podcast. You're going to read some of our articles, maybe some other articles. And you're going to piece together what you believe is your personality based on this information. Now, you're going to probably have people you trust more than others, people that sound like they know what they're talking about, have done a lot of work and research. And I hope those people might be us. Some of those people might be us because I think we do know what we're talking about. But again, it comes down to you. And in our new world, our modern world, this is going to be every part of your life. This isn't just your personality type. I mean, how you vote, how you spend your money, how you deal with your health care, how you raise your children. There's going to be everyone's going to say, I've got the answer. I'm the expert. Listen to me. And there's so much conflicting information, so much nuance here. You're going to have to take all of that and come up with the best thing for you in every area of your life, and personality type is no different. Yeah, well, Dario Nardi calls it your best fit type. And if, I mean, he basically, when he was doing all of his experiments at UCLA, he would let the person determine what their type was through, you know, reading a series of descriptions and trying to figure out what they identified with the strongest. So from his philosophy, you know, you, you don't really have a right to tell somebody what their type is, right? It's their best fit type. Now that said, I, I, I would modify that just a little bit to say that, you know, this is a powerful tool sometimes in the hands of the unskilled. Yeah. And so, you know, somebody, so I've, I've known lots of people who have mistyped themselves. It's not that big of a deal if they do, as long as they're not making any fundamental, you know, major decisions. Like, I'm not going to date this person because I'm this type and they're this type. And so, therefore, even though I'm attracted to them, I'm not going to date them, right? Which would be a terrible, terrible thing to do, <laughs> right? Um, so, as long as you're not making those kinds of decisions based on your type, it's okay if you've mistyped yourself. It's not the end of the world. And that said, there is something to be said for getting your accurate type. It, when you actually know your accurate type and you have a good description of that type, there's a lot of power that can be wielded there, right? There's a lot of personal development opportunities in really knowing your, your type. However, ultimately, fundamentally, it's going to be you that resonates with the, the type, right? Your best fit type. Yeah, you can you can seek experts or you can seek people who know what they're doing. And they can, like you said, be a guide for it. But it's really you reading the type and going, yeah, that resonates. That resonates very strongly with me. So let us let me play devil's advocate here. Let's get a little bit more specific, okay? Someone listening to us has taken our test, taken a couple tests. They've gotten some different types. They're, they really want to know their type. They really want to understand their personality. Let's unpack some steps they could take. What can they do to really – I mean, you, you just said, you know, read some different profiles, you know, read some different personality descriptions, and that's how you can come up with a, a best fit type for yourself. What can a person do – to begin down this journey of really trying to get to the heart of who they are personality-wise. Mm -hmm. Do you have some suggestions? And I can think of some too. Let's really get down specific for somebody to help them in this way. Well, I think people who say that, you know, I've tested out as this type over here and I've tested out this type over here, you're, you're probably not going to test out as all 16 types, right? Like if you have 16 personality assessments, Myers-Briggs, specifically Myers-Briggs personality assessments all over the web, you're probably not going to have tested out as all 16 types. There's going to be a right? pattern that emerges. Yeah, you're going to have, you're probably going to have about two or three, right? Four at the most, I would say. But most people who are really confused, they're at about the, th the two or three level, right? Like it's always this or this, or it's always this, this or this. So the first thing you do is you go, okay, so what am I testing out consistently as? All right, so let's pretend you're, let's pretend you are testing out as an INTJ, an ISTJ, and an INTP. Okay, mm -hmm. I've seen that happen over and over. I'm testing out as an INTJ, an INTP, and an ISTJ. All right, 
what do all of those have in common? <laughs> well, the first thing is you're always consistently testing out as an introvert and as a thinker, right? As an I as a T. So you already have two handled, right? Because over and over and over again, you're testing out as an I and a C. So the question is, am I an N, an S, or um, an N or an S, or am I a J or a P? So at that point, you say, what do I know about ISTJs? What do I know about INTJs? And what do I know about INTPs? All right, so you read the description of ISTJ, and it's talking about, you know, it's describing, basically it's going to do a lot of describing of the introverted sensing cognitive function or memory that we call it in the genius system. And find out if the ISTJ, you know, memory effectiveness or introverted sensing, extroverted thinking description really resonates, right? And if you go, well, there's some parts of it that resonate, some parts that don't. So you go over and you read the INTJ one. And it's going to describe similar things because extroverted thinking or effectiveness is going to be the co-pilot, but it has a very different driver process, right? The driver process for an INTJ is not introverted sensing or memory. It's introverted ex- um, intuition or, or perspectives. Yeah. So now we've got these two side-by-side comparisons. And if you're really like, oh man, the ISTJ really resonates, right? And the INTJ doesn't at all, well, you probably have a winner, right? Like you probably don't even really need to... You, you might want to look at INTP, but already you've got something that's definitely tipping the scales. But if you read both of them, you're like, man, INTJ just really sounds a lot more like me. So now we go to a contrast between INTJ and INTP. What's the primary difference? And if you're like, man, both of those sound so much like me, way more than the ISTJ did, right? And, and now suddenly the ISTJ description is not resonating at all. Yeah. Well, now we know INT. Right now we have three letters, <laughs> and now it's a matter of INTP or INTJ. And then at that point, start. I mean, start really looking at a variety of descriptions on both of them. Um, we just we just recently got uh, you probably. I mean, as the as the listener, you've heard me reference Robert Einstein Wilson probably a million times. It's because you know he's. Robert Anton Wilson is the idea that I'm making love to you right now. <laughs> I love Wilson. And uh, he has a five to set, set called um, Robert Anton Wilson Explains Everything or Old Bob Exposes His Ignorance. And it's not for everybody, but I love it. I've been listening to it on loop. And one of the things he talked about, which I just I just thought was so brilliant, is he said that, you know, before the internet, he, he died in the early 2000s, unfortunately, before I got to meet him. Um, that's okay. <laughs> I've made peace with that. <laughs> or I'm making peace with that. But he said before the internet, his wife, every time they went to like a major bookstore, and she'd find a new set of encyclopedias, she'd buy them. Mm-hmm. She loved, she just collected encyclopedias. So they had a library filled with different sets of encyclopedias. They probably, he said they probably had at least nine or ten. And when he would do research for a book, he'd go check all of the encyclopedias for information on this subject. And yeah. he said all you had to do was open a second set of encyclopedias to determine that book they're going to contradict each other, right? Like Amadeus wrote his first Mozart at, um, uh, you know, at eight in one of them. And in the other one, it's seven. And in another one, it's nine. And in one of them, it's the spring of whatever year. And in the other one, it's the fall of whatever year. He said, certainty belongs to a single set of encyclopedias, Mm -hmm. right? Like the only people who feel certain are the ones who have a single set of encyclopedias. He said, but now that the internet is available, there is no longer a sense of certainty, right? Because... You don't have to go buy nine sets of encyclopedias and try to figure out what, you know, the truth is in amongst these nine different sets. You just look it up, right? Like you go to Wikipedia and then you go to, you know, Joe's website on whatever you're talking about. And then you go to Frank's website on whatever you're talking about. And then you go to Sally's website on whatever you're talking about. And now you've got four different pieces of information available to you instantly, right? Probably on the same first page of Google, and now you get to determine very quickly which one sounds right, which one doesn't sound right, which one, you know, like what, what's kind of feeling good, what's not feeling good. And, and you have to make that determination on your own. You're basically talking about this earlier, right? Yeah. Like in everything we do, we have to do this now. We can't, we can't rely on a single set of encyclopedias because that's no longer an option in the modern world. Right, we ha- we have at our fingertips every possible piece of information that ever ever was, and that means that we no longer have the privilege of certainty. Now it's the same thing that's going to happen. With How these unnerving! Profiles. How unnerving! How terrifying! This is what we want, though. We want certainty as people. 
And often people will not do that kind of work. They yeah. won't contrast and look at all those different sources because they want they want that one expert. They want that doctor to tell them, here's what's wrong with you. Here's the disease you have. Right. And here's the cure. Here's right. the prescription. Bam, it's done. Yeah, it's very, it can be very disconcerting to live in a world where certainty is no longer, you know, uh, certainty is an option, but you got to lo- ignore a lot of information to do it, right? Like you got to really want <laughs> To bury yourself in a hole and not look at all these other pieces of information and then make up stories about anybody who has contrasting information and how they're all, you know, they're all terrible, evil people. Uh, That said, as far as I'm concerned, yeah, it's disconcerting and it's leading us to the next phase of evolution, right? Like to have to determine for yourself what sounds right to you requires a lot of thoughts and a lot of, you know, personal faith in your intuition, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? As long as you're open-minded, keeping a live mind, you know, really not looking at information just to reaffirm biases which we do all the time but the more we practice this lack of certainty and the more we read multiple pieces of information the less we're going to do that right because we're going to exercise the muscle of having to keep an open frame and looking at contrasting information and trying to figure out what you know which, which person sounds like they might be more true than another person all of that said the point is go look at a ton of profiles on INTJs all over the web there's a bajillion of them and go look at a ton of them from INTPs don't just look at personality hacker seriously like i believe that we have some really good high quality content and we are also one voice all right go to personality page go to you know all these other resources online about INTJs and INTPs and figure out which one is catalyzing for you which one feels the closest to you and I would say that that's the absolute best way to have a best fit type, right? Like narrow it down, figure out the pattern, right? What am I mostly testing out as? I'm mostly testing out as ESTJ, ENTJ, and ESTP, okay? Well, go read all three of them, figure it out. And once you get to the point of cognitive functions, it becomes real obvious why those are the three, right? Like why is an ISTJ, an INTJ, and an INTP all testing out like as those three? Well, for an INTP, their 10-year-old process, right, the mental process that they use as their 10-year-old is memory, right? The driver process for an ISTJ. If an INTP is not getting out enough, if they're not, if they're kind of burrowing themselves in their house a little bit too much, that memory process is going to feel real familiar to them. So they're going to probably test out as somebody who's leading with memory, right? Mm -hmm. And so you start going, oh, that's why I keep testing out as these three. Almost always when somebody gives me three options that they keep testing out as, I can instantly tell why, right? Yeah. Because the, some of these types share the same mental processes. So since they're sharing the same mental processes, they're coming up in behavior, right? Depending on who you are and how you're utilizing these processes. So again, going down the rabbit's hole, right? Being willing to submerge yourself under the water and look at the cognitive functions or that deeper content and information. That's number one. And number two, figure out the pattern of what you're mostly testing out as. Start to figure out what the patterns of that are, right? Start reading profiles and going, "Mm, this doesn't really resonate. No, this totally resonates. And then when you got it down to about two, then just do a ton of research into both of them. And one of them will surface as you know, as the one that's resonating with you the most. Uh, A couple things, just so if you're new to Personality Hacker and listening to us, we have an article called The Car Model. If you just type in the search terms in the personalityhacker.com, type in car model. Uh, It's a personality tool that we use to, as a framework for type. And it'll explain when she said your 10-year-old, it'll give you an idea of what she meant by that. The whole article there outlines that that car model. And then also we go into each of the cognitive functions. There's an article online on the website as well that will detail and give description around each of the cognitive functions. So with those two pieces of information, some profiles in front of you, and you're looking at some of these, comparing and contrasting, this is a way that you can get at your personality type uh, more accurately using some of these resources. That's something she's referencing. I just wanted to mention that. Okay, so we've talked about you know, looking at different profiles, going under the surface. We've talked about some of the resources you can use. Um, and, and you know, just to, just to reiterate again, no test, I don't care what written test you do, is going to be 100% accurate for 100% of the people. You know, it's, what is that from Anchorman, the movie? Uh, 60% of the time it works, or 100% of the time it works 60, what is it? What is the, 60% of the time it works every time. I should have my, my funny quote ready before I actually say it. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, it's it's the degree that you're going to have a margin of error, even in a live profiling. Like if, if we did a verification, there's always going to be a possibility for error in anything. You know yourself 
better than anyone else. You know, you know yourself intimately. And, you know, our goal here is to get you to know yourself even better because yeah. we believe once you not only know yourself, but fall in love with who you are, well, that can really be big for the world, right? Because yeah. that's going to light you up. You're going to do what you're passionate about. You're going to get on mission someday and you're going to make an effectual change in the world, whether it be big or small, but we're all adding to this, the world we live in. And the more you know yourself and love yourself, we believe that's the best position for you to be in to grow, change, and make an impact in your world. I, I will say this. It, it sounds like it's all up in the air and it could be this type, it could be this type, and you just kind of have to make a determination. I, I will say, though, that when you when you stumble upon or through a lot of research <laughs> figure out what your personality type is in the Myers-Briggs system and you have a solid description of that – it fits like a glove. Yeah. There is no, it is tailored to your body. Like there is no need to wonder anymore. As soon as it happens, you will know, right? It's kind of like falling in love or the definition of pornography, <laughs> right? It's like, I don't know how to describe it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> yeah. And that will happen when you get your best, when you get your best fit type and have a solid description of it, not just like a, oh, hey, I'm an INFJ and this is how I am, right? But like the, these are the mental processes that an INFJ uses. This is how their mind operates. You know, these are their cognitive function set. This is how they go to their 10-year-old process, like in the car diagram. When you have a good, solid description, oftentimes two things happen. Number one, people's jaw drops from the description, from the accuracy of the description. And the second thing is they usually laugh because it's so familiar, right? Yeah. And even the types that hate to be described well, <laughs> there are certain personality types in the Myers-Rubik system that hate if you truly understand them because they feel like it takes their identity away. Even they will say, I've never felt so understood or so well described. So you will know it when you see it, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's why I say read a lot of descriptions of, like if you've narrowed it down to a couple, read a lot of descriptions because there's some really crappy descriptions out there. So keep reading until you run into one that is the best description that you've ever had of yourself from a total stranger online, and then that's probably your type. So it's not just a matter of like, you know, it, it's it's not a daily horoscope. All yeah, right. we, we sound like we're being real freeform and we're up in the air. I mean, if you if you talk to us, if we if we had lunch together, we would probably be pretty certain about your personality type. We'd say, well, you're this type. And we probably, 99% of the time, we're not going to be waffling at all. We're yeah. going to be fairly certain. What we're giving room for here is we know that we're not, we're fallible. We're not infallible people. Uh, here at Personality Hacker or anybody that's doing this, this is not an exact science. It's not like we can go inside your mind and hook electrodes directly to your, you know, to your, your, neurons and be able to determine how your mind's doing this stuff yet <laughs> working on it we're working on it but you know the, the whole point is like you know we we sound more tenuous than i think we should on this podcast because we're we're pretty certain about how type works we just always want to leave room for you know being wrong being correctable and all that because we realize that this is just a map this is not reality this is just a way to describe reality. This is just this is the best we have right now as humans to describe who we are as people. Obviously, there's seven billion personality types, right? We've distilled it in the Myers Briggs system. The Myers Briggs system has distilled that down to sixteen. So we fit. We try to fit people into sixteen of these. But there's so much nuance, so much variables, and there's then the Enneagram, the Graves model. There's all these other typology systems to get a full picture of your personality. You need to incorporate all of that and. If you incorporate so much, then it almost becomes useless because you have too much information. You know, we, we talk about having too many maps and it's just like... You need... Or useless maps that yeah. have... I mean, a, 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 <laughs> an honest map of New York, an accurate, a truly accurate map of New York... Would be unusable. Yeah. Well, it would have to be... First of all, it'd have to be a few hundred years old. Um, and it would have to incorporate every moment of the last few hundred years. It would also have to be the actual size of Manhattan. It would have to be the actual size of Manhattan. And it would have to incorporate how many different rats have lived there and how many different bacteria, how many trillions of bacteria. And it would have to be like, it would have to be the thing, yeah. right? And that's unusable. So that's the point of, that's the point of personality types. The point of personality types is go, hey, let's make this manageable. Yeah. Let's make it so that it's, a decent description of reality, something that I can resonate with, 
something that feels right to me and it helps me, you know, helps guide me in a good direction. That's the only purpose of personality types. And if Myers-Briggs is not right for you, then don't use it. Yeah. Like there's nothing empirically true here. There's nothing, like if you, if you study Myers-Briggs for 10 or 15 years and you never, ever settle upon a type that feels right to you, a best fit type, Myers-Briggs is probably not the right tool for you to be using. You might want to like figure out a different tool to be using. So it's not like you have to shoehorn yourself into anything. I believe it's an incredibly powerful tool when used well, which is one of the reasons why I advocate it, right? And I study it. Doesn't mean it's empirical reality. There is yeah. no there is no mistaking here that this is definitive, objective, material, rea- concrete reality. This is a guide. So when you when you run into the one that is, I mean, think of your personality type as the guide itself. You could think of the profile description as a coach in and of itself. When you run into that correct profile, it's like running into the right coach. It will help get you to the next level. If you don't run into that, you know, that at all within the Myers Briggs system, well, then go check out other systems, and you might have a better coach there. Yeah. I do think that though most people, most people will find their best fit type. And as soon as they do, it feels pretty good. It feels pretty good when you do it. Yeah. So we want to hear from you. Let us know your thoughts, uh, questions, comments you have. You can find us over at personalityhacker.com, facebook.com forward slash personality hacker, which is a growing community of like minds just like you coming together. We actually informally have had uh, study groups forming on the on the Facebook page. It's so cool. Around the owner's manual program that we've put out and Intuitive Awakening, we've have people coming together to connect with each other and support each other in taking the online courses that Personal Hacker offers, which I think is amazing because I love that supportive community that's developing there. I love that it organically surfaced we yeah. didn't have to like advertise or anything we weren't like hey we're putting a study together group you know study group together on facebook somebody was like hey i'm doing this you want to join me mm. so if you have as a listener if you have um gotten owner's manual you know your personality the owner's manual or the intuitive awakening program and you're interested in you know being connected with one of these groups let us know and if you have been holding off on getting one of these programs because you didn't you know you weren't sure what kind of support there is this is a great time to you know yeah. jump on that this is a great time to get either the owner's manual program or intuitive awakening and then just shoot us an email and go hey how can i get connected with a study group and and we'll hook you up yeah absolutely so uh also come over to itunes subscribe to the podcast and leave a comment leave some feedback on itunes we'd love to hear what you think and uh man antonia when she reads podcast comments <laughs> she just gets giddy with delight I so do. i'm just throwing that one out there hey we want to talk to you on the next episode my name is joel mark witt and i'm antonia dodge you've been listening to the personality hacker podcast we'll talk to you next time mm-hmm.